Welcome to the future. Get ready to explore how spirituality and science will come together in the age of Aquarius. Hosted by JC Nova. Welcome to the age of Aquarius, where we embark on a cosmic exploration into the realm of remote viewing. Today, we are honored to have Lynn Buchanan, a renowned remote viewer and former military intelligence specialist, join us on the show. For the past 30 years, the U.S. government has been secretly training a select group of military personnel in the art of remote viewing, the ability to perceive the thoughts and experiences of others through the power of the mind. Lynn Buchanan, an expert in remote viewing and its potential, shares with us his personal experiences as a member of a U.S. Army intelligence group. During his time in the military, Lynn trained personnel who utilized their innate psychic abilities to gather information. During significant events such as the Iran hostage crisis, the Chernobyl disaster, and the Gulf War. In addition to his military career, Lynn is a highly regarded speaker on remote viewing and has written several books on the subject, including The Seventh Sense. He has also been featured in documentaries and television shows, showcasing his remote viewing abilities and discussing the science and techniques behind the practice. Join us today as Lynn Buchanan shares how he was transformed from an ordinary soldier into one of the nation's leading psychic spies. Get ready for a fascinating discussion. Enjoy the show. So I just want to dive in. Tell us a little bit more about you and your background. Well, I was pulled into this remote viewing unit in the U.S. military. We did intelligence gathering. I was in that for about eight and a half years when I retired. I started working as a civilian. I also started a thing called the Assigned Witness Program for Police Departments. Once the existence of this became declassified, I started getting all kinds of requests for training because I was the trainer of the unit. Ever since, I've just been training, working projects for companies, for police departments, medical applications space research, scientific and research and development projects, and so on. It's the most interesting job I've ever had in my life. I love it. (laughs) It sounds fascinating. Can you tell me a little bit more about the military's controlled remote viewers program? How long was that in place? And if you're able to share the information where you were located? We were at Fort Meade, Maryland. The unit itself lasted for close to 20 years and was highly classified. It started, well, let me give you the whole story here. When Hitler lost the war, he had been doing psychic intelligence research and doing very well at it. When he lost the war, France, England, and the U.S., started taking all of the scientific developments, the rocketry, the atomic work, and all that. Russia was also one of the four winners. They were the only ones interested in the psychic stuff. Well, in the 60s, we started realizing that we were losing all of our classified information. Couldn't find out how. (laughs) And come to find out, Russia had developed this and was using it to spy on us. And so our intelligence effort, when they found that out, said, well, we'll just use it and spy right back at them. (laughs) And so in the 60s, they developed the uh, remote viewing unit. Of course, they had no access to the material that the Russians had, so they went out to Stanford Research Institute And there were two laser physicists out there who had been working on this. And so they started the unit, and the unit kept going until 1992. So what type of projects were you working on personally? What information can you share? 
was it strictly military related? Like you were working remote viewing, like saying, looking to see what the Russians might be doing or another country, or were you also working on more government related projects locally? We were working on foreign military and foreign government, foreign scientific developments and all that. The thing is, a lot of people think, oh, did you spy on us? You know, we had a strict, strict edict that U.S. citizens were not to be remote viewed. U.S. companies were not to be remote viewed unless there was some edict from Congress because there might be national security reasons that they thought the people or the countries were doing something illegal. Other than that, everything we did was collecting intelligence on other countries. And how did the intelligence that you collected, how did that impact some of the military decisions that were made during that time period? It went into the big melting pot of all of the intel services, spy the sky satellites, ground agents, and all that. And so our information got mixed in. Many times it was very influential in decision-making. At other times, it was just added information to what they already knew or what they called adjunct information to fill out what they what they thought they already knew. <laughs> How many people were in the program? Over the 20 or so years, I think there were around 18 viewers. And were you located all just in Maryland or were you located all over the world? No, in Maryland. Yeah. Do you have any particular project that you worked on that stands out to you that you could share with us? Oh, tons of them. The added part that we can share, that cuts it down so. But yeah, we did a lot of uh, work on the Cold War. We did tremendous amount of work on political and military hostages, you know, when soldiers got captured, finding them, finding ways to safely rescue them. Also, the scientific and military developments in foreign countries, plus the plans and intentions of foreign leaders and military leaders. Yeah. So... With this mental espionage, when you worked on top secret government and military projects, what was part of the the training? How did you train people on your team to be able to learn how to remote view? Were you looking for like specific characteristics that a person might have? I'm just curious how you chose people to be in the program. When they brought me into the program, they were still looking for people who were displaying very strong Psi abilities. Actually, I wasn't meant to be in the program. I've had PK experiences my whole life. I had gotten angry and destroyed several million dollars of computers. They just went down. A whole field station went down. So General Stogelbein, who was head of the Intelligence and Security Command, took me to D.C. to start a unit hopefully where we would learn to destroy enemy computers with the end goal of learning how to control, mentally control the enemy computers so that we could send their missiles into the sea or turn around, send them right back at them, and things like that. And also collect intelligence, mentally collect intelligence from their computers. Congress would not fund that, so he stuck me out into the remote viewing unit. The process of learning controlled remote viewing is a long process. It's actually comparable to a martial art of the mind. You go through the different levels of training, so it takes quite a while to learn. It's, it's not just, you know, close your eyes and imagine things. It's a definite protocol that was developed by a man named Ingo Swine, further developed at Stanford Research, and then further developed by the military. I was there 
I guess about two years before I became the trader. I would say it took me two years to really totally become proficient at the control of remote viewing. I'm just curious, to be a remote viewer, that must be from an energy perspective, could be very draining. How did you mentally prepare yourself? Did you have to do this like on a daily basis? And were you able to share with your family what you were doing? Or or was everything just top secret? Well, we weren't allowed to share it with our family because it was classified. It wasn't top secret, but it was classified. As far as the preparation for a remote viewing session, each person finds that they have a different way to prepare. Some people meditate beforehand. Some people listen to music beforehand. The way that worked best for me was to simply do one job, next job, next job, remote view, do the next job, and so on, and just make it another job of the day. We worked Every day, of course, because that was our job, you know, to remote view and collect intelligence. But we had, of course, paperwork to do, other stuff like that. So for me, I just made it whap, 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 one more job of the day. And that worked best for me. And the way we find out what works best is to keep a database. You keep a database as to every perception you get. And when you get feedback, you judge it. Was it right, wrong, or kept feedback? You put that into the database, and the database actually tells you what you're good at, what you're not good at. Different viewers are good at different things. It got to where we can now, you know, find out what a police department needs to know, find out the best viewer for each question and task the viewer that's best for that individual question. That way we get that overall higher score. Can you explain to the listeners a little bit more, like just walk walk me through like a remote viewing experience if you're given a specific target? And if I understand you correctly, you're mentally focusing on that target and then you're trying to gather what information comes to mind while you're focusing on that target. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, this is like into martial art because you don't go into a trance and there's not a lot of mental psychic stuff going on. Your subconscious mind is psychic. Your conscious mind is not. And your conscious mind is logical. So what we do is, in training, we start out with, you know, the wax on, wipe off type thing. We start out by telling a student of water and have them make a sketch. You know, they'll usually make a, a wavy line and land. They'll make a flat line or else a mountain or something like that in space. We do that over and over and over, hundreds or thousands of times, until it becomes so knee-jerk reactive that any time you say water without thinking about it, they'll make the wavy line and all that. When that becomes knee-jerk reactive, you've done your wax on, wipe off, and then we can say to a student, I have a target. The picture of it's in the envelope. What's in the target? And their hand will go wavy line, straight line, and how does it angle? And they look and they say, well, I don't know what the picture is, but there's water, land, and something man-made. You take the picture out, and there's a ship on the water at the dock. Something man-made in the water on land. What has happened is their subconscious mind has used the body to simply tell you what's at the site. Now, that's the first level of work. Then you get into the second level where you then say, Oh, really? Tell me about the water. Okay, and then you start seeing what you taste 
what you feel for the temperature of always cold. Mm, taste salty, and so on. So you're still using your body. You don't go into a trance. You just pay attention to your feelings, what you taste, what you hear, what you smell, things like that. Then to the third level, we get to where we can sketch what's actually at the site. The fourth level, we go into taking the parts of the sketch and finding tremendous detail about each part of that sketch, like the targets of a foreign computer. Okay, we get down to a single board that's being developed on that computer. We start drawing the schematics of the board. And so it goes even beyond that through two more stages, three more stages, actually. With each stage, the information gets more detailed, more accurate. This is so far beyond what natural psychics can do that it's just amazing. Can you tell me more about the assigned witness program that you started and when did you establish it? And just tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, right after I got out and it became declassified, I was working for a police department one time. We only worked with the detectives. The detective was asking me these questions back and forth and expecting me to do something psychic. And I finally said, look, what is it you really need? And he said, well, what I really need is a witness. And I said, I can assign one. And this light kind of came on it. He said, oh, that's what you do, isn't it? And that was the beginning of the assigned witness program where we would assign remote viewers to actually witness a crime that had no real witnesses, you know. That would give the detective the information they would need to organize their investigation. And with this, they found a lot of missing kids. They solved a lot of crimes. They found missing evidence that was needed for prosecutions and, and things like that. People have asked me many times, how many kids did you bring home? We didn't bring home any kids. We provided the information that let the police bring home kids. And how many crimes did you solve? We didn't solve any. We provided the information that let the police solve the crimes. When we worked for the uh, space development people, we provide the information that helps them do their development. When we work for businesses, we provide the information that lets them make their business decisions and all that. And so the remote viewing provides information. So on the cases that you worked on with the police department, say, for example, did you ever work on unsolved cold cases to provide the police department information? It sounds like about perhaps someone they should be talking to that they haven't, or perhaps they already talked to that potential person that might be attached to the case and you're providing additional information about it? Well, sure. In fact, that's most of what we did. The police are very possessing of about things, and usually they have such a avoidance of anything that connected with the word psychic that they just won't do it. The military method has gained favor, actually, with the police, and so they're starting to use this a lot now where they would avoid natural psychics. But generally, even still, they won't call us until they have just tried every other thing to solve the case and have run into a brick wall. And uh, many times, the first case that a uh, police department will task us on will be an old, unsolved case just to see if we can do it. Once they find out that we can provide the information that helps solve the case, then they start giving us current cases. <laughs> then we can't keep up with them because almost every case they have, we, oh yeah, we need some information, yeah. 
How many cases have you worked on over the years? Oh, I don't know. I've lost count a long time ago. Uh, many. Can you explain what the difference is between remote viewing and psychic detectives, per se? A psychic detective uses the normal psychic work. That, listen, there are a lot of them that are really, really good. But generally, they don't get the detail, the amount of details that the controlled remote viewing will get. They get the generalities. I've seen many of them get things like, there's a street sign and the street name begins with the letter S. Okay. Recently, well, no, a couple of years back, one of the remote viewers, a man named Joe McMonagle, went over to Japan, was on Japanese TV being interviewed, and their police provided him with a cold case and said, this woman has been missing for, I think it was eight years. Can you find her? He not only found her, drew where she was, he drew a map to the building, told what room on what floor she was in. The police went there, knocked on the door, and there she was. Was she alive or dead? She was alive, yeah. So she was just hiding? She was basically hiding. She just had enough of her marriage and everything and just walked out and disappeared, you know. But he was able to do that. That's something that a psychic detective can't do. I'm just curious to go back to like an unsolved case. Is the remote viewer... For example, we're working on a an unsolved case, doing a podcast series on it called Dragonfly, and it's the unsolved murder of Brett Cantor. But we know quite a bit about the case, but I'm just thinking of the actual crime itself. Can remote viewers go back to when the incident actually happened and say whether or not a certain person was there? Or I'm just curious, like what type of detail they provide to the police department? Yeah, this is one thing that we found out over over the many years of working this, and this works for remote viewers and also for natural psychics, psychic detectives and all that. Instead of saying what happened, your conscious mind works best present time. Your subconscious mind also works best present time, but it's not tied to time. And so instead of saying what happened, we will say, move back to a certain place and a certain time and, and give those basic coordinates and say, now what is happening? And the subconscious mind will move back to that time and place and see at present time, report to your body present time. Your body picks up, your, your conscious mind picks that up and tells you what is happening now. And the remote viewer doesn't know that they're actually working a past time. This is one thing about the controlled remote viewing. We don't tell you what the target is. For remote viewer, controlled remote viewer, we may say, this is project number 220507. Question three, what's the answer? And that's it. Wow. How many remote viewers are working in the assigned witness program with you? Uh, the assigned witness program sort of fell apart under the weight of lawyers getting involved, saying you can't work for this police department without a license, and, and you can't get a license because... There's no such license yet, and so the court cases just got put on hold. Any work we do now is not under the assigned witness program. We just do it pro bono for police departments individually and as a uh, group. Now, there is a detective who is using basically about 25 high-level, experienced, well-trained, controlled remote viewers 
she is doing work. She has the detective's license. She has the legal right to provide information about people under investigation and all that. This was another thing the lawyers piled in on us about was that you're collecting information on people. That's even though it was under supervision of the police, it could still be considered invasion of privacy and all that. And so the lawyers just basically ended the what was it Mark Twain said, if you want a good life, first kill all the lawyers. <laughs> So basically now you work on, on cases when invited to participate and provide information where you can. That's right. I am now 82 years old. My wife passed away suddenly and unexpectedly recently. And so... Oh, I'm sorry. I have no help now, so I'm doing all the work myself. And so mainly by this time, we have plenty of very well-trained remote viewers. And so when these projects come in, generally I'm finding the remote viewer who is most qualified for the project and just passing the project onto them. And I'm developing online courses using videos. I have two courses out now. One is the basic level, which is over 160 videos of uh, the intermediate level, which has over right around 140 videos, and I have nine more courses to go. I'm just trying to get all these courses generated and up online for people to learn before I wind up in the old folks' home. <laughs> so you're focusing on the education and helping train new remote viewers to help. Yeah, I still get contacted for the work. But these days, there are so many good remote viewers out there who are well trained that I find the best viewer for the job and pass the job on to them. Yeah. How do you think remote viewing will change in the age of Aquarius? I think of the film that was popular, like Minority Report. And I'm just curious how you think it will continue to evolve in the next five years. Well, for one thing, intelligence collection, basically, there are no more secrets anymore. We can find any information anywhere in space and time. The intelligence gathering is fantastic ability. The police work, we can help find information that they can't find readily or, you know, that they can't find at all. As far as research and development, I've been very active in fact, this is some of the work I still do myself in uh, space exploration, moon exploration, and so on. That's an interest of mine. I still work the missing children cases because that's my, my main concern, really. But the other cases, the business cases, and all that, I pass on. Do you think it'll become a more accepted practice, the remote viewing in the age of Aquarius, where I know that we have, like, as far as like information and artificial intelligence and all kinds of different tools that the police department or individuals can use to find someone. But the remote viewing, I think, adds an extra level where the remote viewer can go direct to where what happened, which, you know, short of having a like a surveillance camera, you wouldn't actually know that. So or perhaps the remote viewer can identify another person was there that maybe perhaps the police department wasn't aware of previously. Artificial intelligence is becoming smarter and smarter and doing some of this work, but it has some serious flaws to it. Now, remote viewers are never 100% accurate. You know, there's the human factor. As long as we have humans doing it, it's never going to be totally perfect. We have pretty much a higher accuracy rate than the artificial intelligence does. In fact, in the military, we got a report one time saying that we had the highest accuracy rate of any of the intelligence services, higher than spy-the-sky satellite, higher than ground agents, and, and so on. 
That's fascinating. Do you have any concerns that future remote viewers might use this ability for evil purposes? That's always been a concern. Yeah, absolutely. Ethics is a big, big part of controlled remote viewing, personal ethics. And then the good thing about the ethical part is that whatever goes around comes around. If you use the controlled remote viewing to hurt people, you wind up hurting yourself. If you use it to help people, you wind up helping yourself. It may not be immediate, but in the long run, it's very definitely true. In the short run, somebody who wants to use the controlled remote viewing for evil purposes, it's possible. This is one of the reasons why I try to be very careful about who I take on the students. Who you choose to share the knowledge with. Yeah, I just don't want my work in life to be used for evil. I don't. Well, that's very commendable because we're all human and there's always the power between good and evil and greed and all those challenges that we all face today. Yeah, and even the most altruistic, most Christian person ever, most forgiving person ever, at one point gets mad and wants revenge. So, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah, we have to be mindful of that. This has been a great conversation. I'm so fascinated. I'm sure there's, there's lots of people that would like to learn more about remote viewing. What is the best way for people to learn more about your, your classes and contact you if they want to reach out? I have a website, crviewer.com, crviewer.com. There's tons of information on it. And there are also over 400 practice targets that you can use with some instruction on how to do it at the most basic level. I don't track anybody, so you can go to that website. There are all those things you can try your hand at, see how it works. There's also a lot of explanation about what it is, how it works, and all that. I have a book. The Seventh Sense, which uh, talks about the military work, my experiences in the military, and so on. And the back of it has appendices that has exercises to develop your abilities. Down at the bottom of the opening page of my website are links to the two courses I have going already. One is Associative Remote View and which is a specialty type of remote viewing that is used to predict the outcome of events that have a limited number of outcomes, such as the lottery, horse races, who's going to be president, will the baby be a boy or girl, decisions like that that have a limited number of outcomes. The CRV is for any and all information, anywhere. It's a very long course. It's in great detail. But those courses are there. And I have pre-sign-up videos warning people about what they are getting, what they're not getting. If all they want, you know, is to win the lottery, don't sign up for CRV. <laughs> sign up for the air. It's cheaper, it's faster, and, well, it's a six-month course, really. But try to guide people into what they want to use it for, giving them the best thing. That's fantastic. I will make sure that the links to your website and information on your book is in the show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Lynn. It was great talking with you. Nice talking to you. Thank you very much. You just heard the Age of Aquarius podcast with your host, JC Nova. Remember to subscribe to the show on your favorite streaming platform. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you again for tuning in to today's episode of Age of Aquarius. I hope you enjoyed our journey into the world of remote viewing with Lynn Buchanan. If you're interested in learning more, be sure to visit his website, 
at crviewer.com. If you like the show, follow us on your favorite streaming platform so you never miss another episode. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the wonders of the cosmos. I'm JC Nova. Thanks for listening. <laughs>